So that obviously means we're going to have to take a little bit different approach to that this week and next week as we're trying to just pick up on the whole Gospel of Matthew. So we'll try and figure out the, some of the philosophies and, and some of the, the reasons behind and the context and how it ties in in that sense as opposed to spending a lot of time digging very deeply into individual things that are said within these chapters. So I want to start here. Uh, kind of looking at an, an outline, if you will, of uh, this section, starting in chapter 5 and verse 1, going through chapter 8 and verse 1. And uh, we previously had dealt with the announcement of the kingdom, uh, Jesus talking about the kingdom, John talking about the kingdom. Uh, there was a, a lot of healing that was going on. There was a calling of the disciples. All of that happened prior to getting to chapter 1, the baptism of Jesus temptation of Jesus, all of that. Sometimes what happens is, as we've said before, you get from the end of chapter 4, and you start on uh, chapter 5, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish how long some of these things took, or what the, the time frames, and what exactly happened in what order. But in chapter 5, he's, he's going to see the crowds that are gathering, it tells us. Uh, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So that's where it's going to start. You've got it starting with Jesus ascending up the, the mountain. And this is, this is not like a mountain that would have taken days to ascend. But it, it was a high place. He's up on an area. I don't know how many people remember when we watched the, what was the name of that? Was it Following the Messiah? Or, okay, Following the Messiah from the uh, Appian Way videos that we watched, where it showed that very natural amphitheater kind of set up where he could have been in one place and others could have been here. That, that kind of thing happens. He's up in an area where at least he can, can teach and, and the people can hear, but he's going to ascend up because you've got these big crowds that are here. And, and you, you've got him ascending up first. And I've labeled that next section, which is the Beatitudes, uh, and the Salt and Light really up in there as well. But I've labeled that an invitation to ascend the mountain of God. And the reason I've done that is because it seems that that's what Jesus is doing. He's going to start describing uh, a character, uh, a, a way of life that is who he is. Uh, a lot of times you can look at the Beatitudes almost like here's a self-portrait of Jesus that he's asking us to aspire to. So it's a call to others to ascend up that spiritual mountain, to try to live a life like God would have us to live. And in that, it, we have the Beatitudes, we have the example of salt and what happens to salt if it loses its flavor, that kind of thing. We, and we'll get into those in a minute. But, and then also the light and hiding a light, the city on a hill, all that goes with that. <laughs> Following that, you have several words about the law. And he's going to make some statements about the law. But he's going to specifically deal with some issues that show up in there. Anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, love. All of those are going to show up as he's having a discussion about the law. And so as you move forward from that point, uh, you're going to have some words about worship. Chapter 6 is going to start off with him talking about different aspects of worship. He's going to talk about giving. He's going to talk about praying. He's going to talk about fasting in the beginning of chapter 6. So... 
that you go from these issues of uh, who we're supposed to be and then issues about the law, and he's going to talk about worship, and, and then he, he, he just kind of goes into multiple thoughts after that that I just labeled some thoughts on priorities and relationships. He's going to talk about heaven and earth and, and the one versus the other, light and darkness, God and money. He's going to talk about anxiousness versus trust in, in God. He's going to talk about making judgments and the, and the relationships. How do we deal with, with people? And, and then finish in that section with the golden rule in chapter 7, verse 12. As you continue, then he will have these exhortations that show up as the narrow versus the broad way and, and how it is that we're supposed to walk. Good fruit versus bad fruit. Uh, warning about the judgment that is to come and, and the two different foundations that exist. The house that is built on the rock versus the house that is built on the sand. And, and then you have kind of the finishing of that and the descending back down. So, uh, an incredible amount of topics that are, are covered in there. So let me just ask for an impression when you read Sermon on the Mount. Tell me what kind of things pop into your mind normally when you read and you think of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Oh, no, go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. It, it's spoken inwardly in, in my life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It doesn't wait very long, either, does it? Yeah. It's like, it's like he, gets, he gets there and opens his mouth, it says, and as soon as he starts saying anything, he gets pretty frozen. Bob? How long did it take? How, how long did it take? About how long did he speak? 27 minutes. Uh, uh, no, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can recite the, the whole thing. I'm saying if you know it by heart or read it, and that's about what it takes. It may maybe take you 25, 27 minutes, something like that, to work all the way through it. I don't picture the sermon as being a 27-minute sermon or, or teaching. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of the thing that I look at here is it begins to be a self-reflection thing where we think, man, you know, what is our attention span to the truth or to Yeah, good, good point. The, and, you know, and how long does it take to make three points? I had one of my friends say, he called me the other day, he said, you know how Ralph Walker and the World Cup are similar? I said, no, how? He says, it takes 90 minutes to make three points. And so that, that was a little exaggeration, but I know Ralph really appreciated that when I shared that with him as well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, really, attention span, but... The other thing is, and I would ask you this, easier to maintain your attention span in a class or a sermon? Easier in a class, isn't it? And so was there any feedback at all? Was there any discussion exactly how things happened? What we have recorded are certainly the words of Jesus. If it was preached just as a one straight sermon, then I'm guessing he wasn't concerned about trying to finish it in 27 minutes, so he would have taken the time to say things in such a way that would be impactful. Oh, yeah, no question about that. I guarantee they had a better attention span than, than, than people listening to me. But part of that is conditioning as well, is it not? We've become a, a, we've become a culture with a conditioned attention span that is ridiculously short. Uh, for any of us, I'm not saying just you, I'm saying me or any of us. We, we wrestle with that because that's not what we're used to, that's not our culture. Yeah, Tom? Yeah, I think it's interesting because a lot of it is he's taking common ideas, common conceptions, from the Jewish lifestyle, the, the law, and he's kind of flipping it on his head a little bit. He's, he's um, expanding their understanding of it, and a lot of people are saying, well, no, that's, that's not how it's supposed to be, and he's kind of saying it really should be, though. Yeah. So he's getting them to rethink some things, which I think is very important. Let me go Paul and then back to Seth.
Yeah, and, now, and Paul, if you didn't hear that, Paul was saying, you know, you, you read this, then you go back to the Old Testament. He's not really telling us something new as much as he's telling us what was already there. With the exception of, I will tell you, uh, we're going to get into a section where he is saying what was taught matches with what he's teaching. God didn't change his principles. What, what was written, at least, matches with what he's teaching. What they were practicing, what they were hearing from each other does not match. And so that's what he's trying to straighten out. So it's not new teaching as much as it is he's saying, you're not doing what he told you to do to begin with. Uh, and he's trying to correct some of that. We'll see that when we get especially to the uh, section, second section there uh, of chapter 5. Seth? We read in chapter 8, verse 1, that a, a great multitude followed him. Multitudes followed him, but what were the varying levels of how everybody received it? You know, what was their, you know, to be in that crowd and to hear how other people responded to what was being said? I'm sure there was a lot of variance in that. I don't know. Maybe that's academic, but I just... No, I, I think that's the case, and it was the case anywhere. I mean, it's just like, you know, at the, at the cross of Jesus, there were those that were curiosity seekers, there were those that were enemies of him, there were those that were friends of him. I mean, that, that, that happens in any large audience that he's with. Some are just curiosity seekers, some are trying to trap him. There's, there's a lot of different people, and I'm guessing there's a lot of chatter going on between the people as he's teaching things as well. Uh, they're having discussions amongst themselves. So let's pick up in chapter 5. And we'll go through these Beatitudes first. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness' sake, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So as he starts with these ideas of the Beatitudes, he's going to have two different things about each one of these. He's going to talk about the quality itself where he talks about blessed are those. Poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, hunger, thirst, after righteousness, pure in heart, I'm and those two are out of order, intentionally, you'll see why in a minute. Pure in heart, and then the merciful, they're, they're the other way in the listening. Pure in heart, the merciful, the peacemakers, persecuted for righteousness' sake. All right, so, he starts, let's just, let's just quickly hit the very first one. Poor in spirit, what is he, what is he saying here? And why do you think he would start there? The humble. Clearly talking about the humble. So why start with the humble? Go ahead, Tim. I think for several of these, he's starting with something that will catch them, that they can identify with, uh, because this is a crowd of poor people mostly. And it's, he reminds you, though, of those who, the words sound great, and he's catching their agreement, and later on they're going to go away and go, wait, you know, do I really match up with that? So I think there's some depth there that may not have come across the first. Yeah, and I think that's a great point as well. Think about it this way. You know, and, and why, well, let me just, again, why would you even start with the concept of humble? Don't feel very blessed. What's that? Don't feel very blessed sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't feel very blessed, and he's going to talk about the, you know, how blessed you are, and, and the word beatitude obviously doesn't show up in here, but it just means, it just carries that idea of extremely blessed are, are, are these people. So it's called the, the beatitude. Think of it from the standpoint of, let's figure out who we are first. In other words, blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you have the right view of self? Because if I don't have the right view of self, nothing else that he teaches is going to set very well. So I have to at least get the right view of self. So I, he doesn't break it up this way, but for me a few years ago when I was going through this, some of these things kind of clicked in a, a little bit different sense for me. And so I'm, I'm doing this. He talks about the reward. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on the rewards. I'll just tell you that. Because, for one, we don't have a lot of time. But I think all the rewards are, are in fact, 
very similar thought processes. There's just, there's just blessings that come from being the kind of person that God expects you to become. I think both present and future. When he talks about uh, the comfort that we receive, that, that's present. Paul told the Corinthians, God is the God of all comfort. And we understand that. You go back and read Psalm 37, and you find out the idea of inheriting the earth. There are things here that we receive because we're following God and, and attitudes and mentalities that we receive here that we can also receive in, in the future as well at, at a higher degree. I want us to focus on what he's trying to create because if, if all you think in terms of we'll have all these blessings that he promises, you get all these blessings if, in fact, I'm the kind of person that he describes on the left-hand side here. So here's what I did with that. I think he starts here. Poor in spirit, those who mourn. Let's figure out who we are, how we feel. In other words, I, I'm destitute without God. Agreed? And the better I see God, the more I understand I'm destitute without God, as Isaiah saw him in that vision in chapter 6. And, and so I'm poor in spirit. I understand it, it is only God. Why am I destitute without God? Because what? Absolutely. Because I have sin in my life, and he saved me from my sin. So I, I have no other way to get salvation. So it is my sin that has separated me from God and made me destitute without God. So I think he starts off by saying, let's, let's make sure you understand that. That you are, in fact, destitute without God. You're poor in spirit. I know that I depend totally on God. There is no self-reliance here. My reliance is on God because of my sin, and I grieve over that. I mourn over my sin. I don't think he's talking about mourning the fact that you lost somebody. I mentioned uh, in, in services the Greg Rabbit, the preacher who just died. His, his family is mourning severely today. There's no question in my mind over that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, uh, the loss of life, everybody mourns. Uh, loss of life, if it's somebody that truly meant something to you, if you love them. I think he's talking about mourning over the situation we're in. I think he's saying, so I, here's what I know. I'm destitute because I'm a sinner, and, and I mourn over the fact that I sin. That's how I truly feel about it. So because of that, what am I going to do? I think he starts to help us develop our character. He's going to say, so let's talk about who you should be. If, if, this is, if this is who I am, what kind of character should I have? He says, meek. What does it mean to be meek? What does that mean? Minimizing yourself. What's that? Small. Minimizing that, yourself. All right, so as you think about yourself, do you think about small? Gentle. Gentle. Serving. Serving. You know, Jesus was meek. So it's not a weakness, is it? it it's, it's a, there's actually a strength, but it's a strength under control because it's the right thing. It's, it's kind of the same idea of when... James talks about how do you control a horse? I mean, a horse is a big thing. You can't control your tongue. You can control a horse by what? Stick a bit in his mouth, right? And so a trained animal is the idea of meek. Plenty of power, not used improperly. And, and that's the way with us. So it's meek and gentle. The way we deal, I think he talks about not only how we deal with people, but even how we deal with God. That the, Our whole approach is, I, I, I'm a meek person. A hunger and thirst after righteousness how do you do that? He's saying, here's the character we need. If you're going to be the character of God, I need people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. What does that mean to you? It's an acquired taste. Yeah. It's something you have to get into because the more you have, the more you will have. Yeah, great point. The, the idea of as I dig more and more in it, and, and the more that I and ingesting the more that I want that because the more satisfying it becomes. And so I've got that incredible desire. We understand the nature of hunger, don't we? How many people already, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you already have thought about what you're having for lunch today? You're kind of excited about it. You ever been there? <laughs> yeah, we can, I'm saying because we, we understand that. I, you know what? I, we, we salivate up over that, don't we? You ever salivate over the Word of God and over living right? I, I want to live rightly so badly. He's not talking about just what we read and what we, what we learn. He's talking about how we live. I, I, I want, I truly 
want to be the best person for God I can possibly be. That not only includes my time in the Word, it includes what I'm doing in life. So he's saying we're trying to develop this character, and then pure in heart. Pure means what? Why is gold listed? Why is there something that's pure gold? There's pure gold. There is 18 karat gold. There is 14 karat gold. There's 10 karat gold. They're all gold, aren't they? What's the difference in them? What's that? Is anything else mixed in? Pure means simple by itself. So pure gold, 24 karat gold, is pure gold to say it's just the gold, nothing else left in it at all. It's just the gold. As you have 18 karat, it's, eight, it's that percent. For every 18 parts of gold, you get six parts of something else, some alloy, or 14 and more, or 10 and more. But it's blended with something. He's saying, I need people who are absolutely <coughs> single in their heart. That's the character he's looking for. One focus in life. Paul talks about that all throughout Philippians. When he continually, it's this one thing I do. Paul says, it doesn't matter what happens to me if Jesus Christ is preached. That is a single mind, single focus in life. And he's saying, that's what I'm looking for. Hearts that absolutely have one thing that they're focused on, and that is serving God. Then he talks about our relationships, the merciful and peacemakers. So if you think about it in these terms, at least for it helps me understand, here's the kind of person he's trying to build. What if, so now I've got my character. What about my relationships? How do I deal with other people? <coughs> he says, blessed are the merciful because they're going to receive mercy. How do I treat other people? Am I merciful to people? Am I not merciful to people? We were, we were joking. Well, Dan, I probably get myself in trouble for this, but we're driving in, in a parking lot, and I was with Ralph, and, and somebody just cut us off, you know, one of those deals where the, you know, the, you're going to a parking space and somebody, they can whip in faster, so they whip in the parking space. I said, man, you know what? We should get out and show them what it's like to mess with Christians. <laughs> well, obviously that's not something we would do. Are, are we merciful or are we looking to, to treat others the, the wrong way? You know, or, or, uh, what kind of attitude? He says, who cares what they deserve? We should be merciful. Why? Because he's merciful to us. So he's saying we ought to have those kind of and the peacemakers. What do you think of when you think of peacemakers? Because he's not talking about the peaceable. We should be peaceable or peaceful. But he says the peacemakers, which changes peaceable by adding what to the equation? An active component. Yeah, it's an active component. I have to do something, don't I? To be a peacemaker. Peacemaker between whom? May very well be between yourself. And, and so God talks about that even amongst brethren and stuff too, doesn't he? He says, you know what? You've got an obligation. Something between you and your brother? Doesn't matter if you're the one at fault or he's the one at fault. He puts the obligation on both in two separate passages. He says, you've got to do something to make that right. Because these relationships, if we can't get these relationships right, he says, you're not going to get this relationship right. It doesn't work that way. He tells husbands and wives the same thing. I love what he tells husbands in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, you better treat your wife the way you're supposed to treat her with honor as a fellow heir, or your prayers will be hindered. Hindered. Not that you'll stop praying. He's just saying they'll stop at the ceiling. They're not going anywhere because you can't get this right. Get this right. How can you love God whom you've not seen if you can't love man whom you've seen? So he says, so peacemakers that way. But I think there's a component of peace between God and man, too, here. Are we peacemakers? Are we trying to help others find the peace that we have? Helping others so that they can understand and have the relationship with God. And then he goes into our mission. In other words, how is that a mission? He says, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, how's that a mission? Do you notice what else he says in there? He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on what? <coughs> On my account, which means why are people saying the things they're saying about you? Because you're being a good Christian. Because you're being a good Christian, doing what God's asked you to do. That is, in fact, who we're supposed to be. And so he says, blessed are you. They're going to persecute you, but blessed are you doing that. Because we have this mission for God. So we're working for God. And then look at that next section. 
He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? No longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put it under a, excuse me, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So now he's going to say, so mission continues by going this way. We're to be salt and light. How are we to be salt and light? First of all, how are you to be salt? He says, we're supposed to be salt. He says, if salt has lost its taste, I've never had salt that I know of long enough that it's lost its taste. Anybody ever had salt that actually has lost its taste? But it can, can't it? You know, and they weren't dealing with salt that was chemically produced like we do, which probably lasts longer than if you were just getting your salt from the water or something or from the ground. So what good was salt? Can you imagine sitting there and shaking that salt on your food? If it had enough taste, you say, seems kind of fruitless, doesn't it, to shake it on? So what, what does that mean to you? How are you supposed to be salt? Yes, go ahead. And I'm sorry, you're going to have to give me your name. Amy. Amy, thank you. Um, you're supposed to have the word living in you, and then that comes out naturally uh, to everybody you meet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how you speak. so as, as I'm living... What is it that both of these passages are, are looking for me to accomplish? Seth? I think about this right answer, but I mean, if you're, if no one can tell you the difference from anybody else that they meet, then maybe we're not standing out as, as we ought to. I think, I mean, a lot of times you, when you notice people are different, if you're, you know, I guess I take it in a business setting. If, you're at a business meeting or whatever, I know what's going to happen after the meetings are over. I know that people are going to go out, and I know, and I think when you see people that don't participate in some of the things that happen after that, I, I don't know if that's it's, the answer you yeah, think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely it's, noticeable. We yeah, notice people, people that you. aren't like the world. Yeah, so, people will ask you. Well, which is what we're told as well. Be ready to give an answer, which means somebody's asking. Maybe a column, and then you can. I always thought of this as kind of a binary choice. You're either salty or you're not. You're, you know, you're either seeking after righteousness or you're not. There's no, you know, there's no spectrum there. It's one or the other. Yeah, good, good point. This, there is no, you know what, I'm a little bit salty, but I'm not very salty. I'm a little bit righteous, but I'm not really righteous. Uh, no, I, I agree. God's dealing with black and whites for us. Ken? Both of those things are, are in positive light. Uh, people enjoy having the salt of their food. They want light when it's dark. And it's kind of like, is the world a better place because you sense? Are you making things better around you within your sphere of influence, or are you just blending? Yeah, great point. You know, and, and, and all those things blend together as far as what, what influence are we having? For what purpose, does he say? What does he say at the end of that when he talked about the light? People are going to see all the good things you're doing. That's important so that they can come up and say, Mark, you're a really good guy. Really appreciate that. They pat me on the shoulder and they can say, you're one of the best people I've ever met. That's, that, is that what he's talking about? What was the purpose? To glorify. to glorify God. Everything they see in my life is being different because it's right, different in the right sense. It ought to be to bring God glory, shouldn't it? And so as they see my life and I'm not like the world, I'm different than the world, and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing positivity to the world for a God who is a positive God. Now, I do think it's interesting when you talk about salt. I read an interesting article the other day. I'll just throw this one out there for you to kind of fall over. But it talked about, uh, like when Abraham was petitioning God on behalf of Sodom. Uh, when, uh, you know, you, you've got that whole negotiation. If there's, you know, if there's this many people, then if there's this many people, and if there's this many people, and God's saying, I'll save it for that many people. This article went on to talk about there's a sense in which, as we're living the way we're living, it might, in fact, make the world more palatable to God for us as well. But 
so that he's not coming in judgment yet because he knows he's got people who are still doing what they're supposed to be doing and living the way they are. I'm not saying that's his point here, but there is a sense in which that could be true as well. So he talks about our home mission and going forward. But then he gets into this section after that where he starts talking about the law. And he says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I truly say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it is all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he talks about each of those things, those six things that we said he's going to talk about, where he talks about anger. You've heard it said before, for those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, and then he's going to say again in verse 27, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, then he says, it was also said in verse 31, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, then oaths, again, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform what the Lord you have sworn. But I say to you, and then retaliation, you heard it said, knife for knife, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, and then he says, finally, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your neighbor, I mean, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So, as he's going to get into this whole section of the law, he starts this way. He says, didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. What does that mean? What's the difference in the concepts here? Abolish almost has the sense that this is no good. Uh, versus fulfill, meaning I'm not taking anything away. This is what it was all about. Yeah, yeah, great, great point. The, the idea of, uh, of abolish carries the idea of, you know what? It, it wasn't right, it wasn't good, we're eliminating it. But he says even specifically, there's not a single word of it that's going to pass away until it's fulfilled. It was that good. Yes? Um, also, just to go off that, it, I don't know the verse, but there's a verse that says the law came to make us conscious of our sin so that we um, could recognize when it is wrong. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a very thing. It's not bad. It is good. It just makes us more aware of what we did was wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they should be thankful. We should be thankful for the for the law. The law wasn't bad. It yeah. wasn't bad. It, it, the nature of the power transfer that is occurring, that it is a internally consistent uh, transfer of power. If you look at something that is abolished uh, in sort of worldly terms, and you have revolutions or coups or changes in uh, you know in their time. Uh, assassinating leaders and a new leader would come in or, or kings or dynasties uh, changing out. And I think what Jesus is pointing out here is that, yes, he is the authority, but he is doing so in a consistent fashion to the way his father set things up in the first place. And that now he is being granted this authority, not as a new or different thing, but as a continuation of the exact same thought that has already been in play. Yeah, I think mean, great point. In other words, the, the, the difference in saying this was planned all along, everything in this part was to get us to this part, is different than saying we're wiping that whole old one away, the whole old part, because something was ineffective or something wasn't working there, and we're starting something all over again. Uh, I, I think fulfillment is, he's saying, I, I, in fact, am bringing to a conclusion everything that this was driving toward, which was to get the Messiah here. Yeah, yeah. And that speaks to his purpose, which I think is another thing that he emphasizes over and over again, is that there's a reason for him to be here, there's a reason for him doing what he's doing, and this is the fulfillment, it's the purpose of, of all that it comes to us. Yeah, great point. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us. Yeah, which is a, which is a, great, a, a great thought. I mean, in other words, the whole, it existed to bring us to a point where there was the Christ. And so it was a schoolmaster to lead 
to this point right here, and he's saying, now we're at this point. This part is fulfilled, this part is started. So it's not an abolishment of, he's just saying, I'm, I'm here to fulfill that. But then he says, you're gonna have to have a greater righteousness. I, that, that's interesting when you think about the people who are listening to some of the things he's saying. And he's saying, I'm telling you, you can't be like some of your religious leaders are. You gotta have a greater righteousness. And that and he immediately starts with these six different things. And, and he's saying, you can't approach these things the way the Pharisees do, the way the, the, the Sadducees do, the way the, the God's religious people of that time were doing. He said, such as, as this whole idea of anger. He said, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to hell fire. He said, so if you're offering that gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. First be reconciled to your brother and come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the garden and be put in prison. Truly I say you'll not get out until every penny has been paid. So he's saying, so here'd be my question. Because he starts all these off saying, you have heard it said to those of old. Were all these things written? In other words, is he saying the law said you couldn't murder, but you could and do whatever else he's talking about. You could be angry with your brother. You could mistreat your brother. I mean, are these, are these teachings in the law? I, I think that's why he's not saying it is written. He's not saying it is written and I'm changing everything. The principles of God have always required people to treat people the way they're supposed to. When he says a little bit later here, talking about you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy, is that what it said in the old law? You, you turn back to Proverbs, and, and we have the Proverbs that tell us then. Your, your enemy is hungry, what are you supposed to do? Feed him. Thirsty, what are you supposed to do? Give him a drink. If he falls down on the road, what are you supposed to do? You supposed to be happy about that? No, you're not supposed to be happy about that and rejoice over that. God has never said, it, it, in either law, it's okay to mistreat people. And Jesus is not saying, you know what, it used to be okay to mistreat them, and now I'm giving you a different thought process here. Any more than when you get into the next section, and he said, you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I'm saying whoever looks at a woman with lust, so what, what do you think? Was, was it okay to lust? Is that a new teaching? It, was okay. it used to be okay to lust under the old law, not okay to lust under Jesus' teachings. No, it's not, it's, it is written. What were they doing with the law? Perverting. They were perverting it, no question about that. They were, they were putting things the way they wanted to, even to the point when they took oaths, weren't they? Things like, you ever remember this as a kid? No, I, no, really. I, you do that, I'll give you five dollars, you know, to your brother. And, and then he does it, you're going, I should have said. And my fingers crossed. Promise doesn't mean the same as my fingers are crossed. Well, they talked about swearing by the temple versus swearing by the gold of the temple. They were making up rules that made it easy for them to circumvent what God was trying to get them to do. So much so that God is saying what? You know what? Here's what you're supposed to have been doing before. Here's what you're supposed to be doing now. You're supposed to be honest. It shouldn't be different. I remember as a child, you remember asking one of your brothers or a sibling or a friend or somebody, do you swear? Because if they swore, that made a difference, didn't it? No, I swear, that's the truth. Christians shouldn't have to do that, should we? The, the whole idea, I, I think he's saying, the, these things are not new teachings. They are the right applications of the teachings they had. Wh whichever it is that he's talking about in, in here. Never was it intended for people to retaliate against one another. It, that's the, he's saying that's not what you're supposed to do. And so I'm telling you, you should have always had the mentality to, to go the extra mile, to do the extra. And I think that's why he's saying, so look at the way they approach righteousness, these Pharisees. He's just saying, look at the way they approach it. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. And so I think even though he's going through multiple things here, it would be very easy for them to get the picture of their religious leaders and understand how they were doing things and to say, that's not what God's looking for. He's looking for, for pure honesty. I played golf with the boys 
uh, every once in a while. I keep a foot wedge in my bag. They don't really keep a foot wedge with them, but that's, that's always helpful. That's, if you don't play any golf, that means if your ball's kind of snookered behind a tree, and you, you walk with your ball, you go. <laughs> now, we have agreement as to who can do that and who can't win when we play, so it's not a violation of the rule. But I assure you, if I'm on PGA and I, I use a foot wedge, something that happens, be penalized for that. He's saying, but you just ought to be honest. It's funny, the golf is called the gentleman's sport. Have you ever seen anybody in football run over to a referee and say, my bad, I held him. I know you didn't see it, but I held him. So if you throw a flag, that would be good. Never, ever happened before. Probably never will happen. But I've watched guys in golf call the rules official and say, hey, I actually don't move my ball. <laughs> like, seriously? Who calls a penalty on himself? But that's, that's the nature of you saying that's a Christian. A Christian is just that honest. That's the kind of integrity we have. And, and so as he deals with all of those, I think that's all he's saying is you need to understand. He's not setting new law. He's saying you guys are making terrible application of what you already do to be right. And I'm just telling you, you need to do it the way that we're saying to do it. You need to have that kind of righteousness in, in your life. Yeah, Ken? Uh, based on what's said later on, when they say he's speaking as one having authority to him or to people speak like this, he was taking a very different approach to the teaching than what they heard. And that's what he said he heard. They heard that from the religious leaders. Yeah. And he's saying, let, let me show you a different way to look at this that's in line with what God wants you to do. Yeah, great, great point. So, it, and as we said, not, not new teaching. It's, it's new teaching to them because it's brand new levels of what they're supposed to be doing. They're getting a totally different understanding. He's just saying, you've been told the wrong thing all along. Let me help you understand what this truly says uh, about who we're supposed to be. And, and then quickly, we may have to pick up on this a little bit next time. It's interesting that he starts in chapter 6 saying, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you'll have no, excuse me, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, the, the focus of this is not this, practicing before other people. Though that's something he mentions here. The focus is not before other people. The focus is what? The focus is this part, in practicing in order to be seen. He said, if that's what you're doing, you're wanting to show. So you think the Pharisees fit that description? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Broaden their phylactery, make sure that people understood, dress in such a way, act in such a way, so that everybody knew. And so when he's going to get in here, he's going to say, he's not telling us, you, if you go out to a restaurant today, he's not telling you you can't pray at the restaurant. That's not what he's doing. But I do think what he's saying is, you get to the restaurant, and you're in one of the, you ever, you ever, you ever a cheese? Loud restaurant. That's just one of those ones that's a loud restaurant. So imagine you're going in there and you're sitting and you stand up and you're hollering there, but hey, hey, we're praying over here. We love our God. We would ask you to please be quiet for a minute so we can express our love to our God. He's saying, I got a problem with that. What's the, what's the point? He's not saying you can't pray, but he's saying don't, don't do it in order to be seen. So he talks about three things. One, giving. He says, giving. How would you do that to be seen? The first time I heard somebody describe this, I heard a preacher who said, so just imagine you're given $100, and the trays come, plate's coming around. You know, we put it in the box now, so it's a little harder, but plate's coming around for collection. He said, you take that $100 bill out of your wallet, and you're just kind of popping that thing, and it's nice and stiff, and you're holding it up there and straightening it out and waiting for that plate to come, and then finally you drop that in there. He said, you got your reward. Everybody saw what you were giving. That's, that's all you're going to get out of that. He's saying, if you're giving, don't, don't give to be seen. Have you ever done something for somebody and wished they had thanked you but they didn't? You ever done that? How many people in here have ever done, just in your head, you ever done something to somebody you thought they would show more gratitude but they didn't? Has there ever been a part of you that wanted to make sure they knew you did it? You know what, I need to let them know what I did for them there. So... You know, that's why it's, it's an advantage of being married. I can, I can go to them and say, let me tell you what your mom did. And then she can go to them and say, let me tell you what your dad did. So then we can both get praised for it. <laughs> no, no. I'm saying if that's the goal, to get praised for having done it, you, you've missed the point. Uh, secondly, and we'll pick up on this the next time when he starts talking about praying, because I want us to look at that prayer. Uh, I want us to think about that. The, the fasting is kind of the same thing, isn't it? 
He says, when you're going to fast, do what? Make sure you don't shave, don't shower, put on your oldest, wrinkliest clothes, and when you walk outside and everybody else is, you know, you're, you're going, you're just, I can barely walk. I haven't eaten in just two days. He says, well, why? You're going to fast? Who should know? God. God should know. That's all that matters, isn't it? God should know why you're doing it, when you're doing it. doesn't mean somebody else can't know. He's saying don't do it for show. I want us to pick up on the prayer because I think that prayer breaks out really nicely as well. So we'll pick that up next time and, and talk about the aspects of that prayer. Uh, and then try to get through the rest of six and, and through seven as well. And then think about how they could have continued to carry that with them. Uh, because it's not the last time he'll teach these things. He'll teach them in other settings as well. And then the, uh, the epistles will deal with multiple of these things as well.